Ruth Padilla divorced. Ruth has been involved in leadership development and theological education in Latin America and beyond for several decades. As a missionary with Christian Reformed World Missions, she has served with a variety of local ministries. She lives in Costa Rica where she shares parenting of their blended multicultural family with her husband, James Padilla Deborst, a narrative theologian, speaker, and teacher. She serves on the board of the Latin American Theological Fellowship and is coordinator of the networking team of International Fellowship of Missions as Transformation. Let's welcome Ruth Padilla Deborst. Buenas noches. In true Latin American fashion, before diving into our topic, I have to bring you greetings. So greetings from your sisters and brothers at Casa Adobe, the intentional Christian community of which my husband and I belong in Costa Rica. In this community, which includes a refugee family from El Salvador, a young Nicaraguan searching for vocation, a Lutheran minister and her teenage son, my husband James, and a few other people here and there, we're learning what it means to live day in and day out, from Monday to Sunday, from shared meals to dirty dishes, from music night to community organizing, from composting to bridging cultural differences, what it means to live as a body of followers of the servant king. I also bring you greetings from SETI, the community of interdisciplinary theological studies, um, which we lead with staff, faculty, and students from across Latin America. And I also bring you greetings from Infimit, a global community of theologian practitioners who seek to nourish the church in an integral practice of mission. Leaderless helpless, hopeless, barely breathing fear, huddled in a small room before locked doors. Some silently brewing dark plans of revenge, most ready to flee as broken victims of powers they can neither face nor understand. All their high expectations have been dashed to pieces. Suddenly, interrupting their aimless watch. Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Jesus is among them. The disciples are overjoyed when they see the Lord. Shock, amazement, disbelief. Yet again, with loving, insistent, wounded hands outstretched, Jesus repeats, peace be with you. Peace, not as the world gives it. My peace, which passes understanding, true peace, just, life-giving peace. Pax Christi, not the false, fake peace of imperial Rome, Pax Romana, held together with swords, crucifixion, nails, and grueling taxation my peace. And yet further, this peace is not simply for your personal well-being. No. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. As the Father has sent me. Sorry, we're going too far on the slides. We need to back up. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. As the Father has sent me, a humble servant who washes the feet of his followers, a prophet murdered for proclaiming justice, the Lord who gives himself away for your reconciliation, so I send you. But do not fear. You do not go alone as helpless, hopeless victims. I now breathe upon you my spirit. No longer need you hide. Hold off, please. <laughs> I give you the breath of life and love that banishes all fear. Freed from fear and propelled by hope, you can open your doors wide. Now we've caught up. <laughs> you can open your doors wide to 
forgive, forgive, seek justice and foster reconciliation until my kingdom comes in full. Now, our faith ancestors did precisely that. They stepped out of the fear-filled hiding place and opened their doors. The encounter with their risen Lord converted disconcerted, overwhelmed victims and suicidal avengers alike into bold and outspoken witnesses of God's justice and God's reconciling love. Truly, the days became darker. Persecution raged. People were pried from home and land. Some were thrown into prison. Others simply disappeared. Many were murdered. Yet, against all natural expectations from within the pain, loss, and uncertainty, a song of hope rang forth nourished a fresh imagination, and carried people forward and outward in compassionate service. Now we can go, Jesus Christ, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross, on a Roman cross. Therefore God exalted him, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. With this joyful, subversive song, Jesus' early followers reminded one another that regardless of appearances, God's is the final word in history. Jesus is Lord. Now, this is a Lord who gives himself away for the sake of others, a servant king. Now, this was not merely a religious confession to be sung in a Sunday chorus. Confessing Jesus as Lord meant no one else was. Not emperors or their lackeys who claimed absolute power and utmost allegiance. Jesus is Lord. Not Caesar. Jesus is Lord. Not Herod. Not the temple leaders, not any slave owner, not any zealot leader, not any man, not any woman, not anything. In addition, the confession of Jesus as only Lord was not merely an individualistic matter with implications for a life to come. This confession was a radical confrontation of all other powers then and there. It had social, economic, political, and ecological teeth. The good news that God was not distant, dead, or indifferent to their condition, but rather with and among them, propelled them into courageous action, even in the midst of the pulls and tugs of Roman imperial taxation and military oppression, and the incomprehension of the Jewish and Greek ancestors alike. And by drawing close to them, God drew them close to one another, and even close to people whom they would naturally consider enemies. In this way began the story of the Christian church, soon schooled in the challenges of breaking down walls deconstructing stereotypes and including the unincludable at their fellowship table. Theirs was the task of eradicating a colonialist imagination with an old, new, liberating imagination. You see, colonialism has many faces, yet they are all products of the incestuous marriage between power, pride, and prejudice, spiced up with a generous dose of racism and self-interest, and propagated and perpetuated through official stories. 
the true story of God's good creation is that there is only one human race. No skin color is more beautiful than any other. No people group is more valuable than any other. And there is no religion so pure, no ideology so right, no cause so just that it is ever acceptable to efface God's image in even one of God's precious creatures. Now, a striking instance of the shift between a colonial imagination and a Christ-centered, spirit-breathed one is narrated in the familiar passage of Acts 10. Much to the initial consternation of the central mother church in Jerusalem, Peter, one of those who had huddled in fear after the crucifixion, not only responded to the summons of a Roman centurion, but also stepped into the intimacy of this pagan man's world and spent days partaking of the same food under the same roof with someone who represented everything the Jewish people feared, hated, and rejected. Cornelius was a soldier of the powerful imperial army that had executed Jesus and continued crushing Israel militarily and strangling it economically. To make matters worse, although Cornelius was said to fear God, he had never taken the steps required to become a full Jewish proselyte. That made him a natural object of suspicion. He and his household adhered, adhered to traditions, habits, diets and values abhorrent to religious Jews. In spite of all these barriers, however, Peter, freed from fear by the Holy Spirit, obediently shared, quote, the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. In so doing, he received the good news of God's reconciling love for all people afresh and was then ready to risk conveying its exuberant breath to the growing, though skeptical, skeptical Christian community. Eventually, over time, by engaging in the practice of God's fearless border-crossing, border-breaking mission, the church in Jerusalem came to a humble recognition that God actually was active outside the confines of their ethnic and linguistic structures, and that they had as much to receive as they had to give in partnership with people from other corners of the empire. As the same story continues, I invite you to fast forward several centuries and spin around the world to arrive in Latin America the context that has shaped my life and theological reflection. Meet my people in Argentina under the military dictatorship of the mid-70s. The days were dark. Persecution raged. People were being pried from home and land. Some were thrown in prison. Others simply disappeared. Many were murdered, like hundreds of thousands across the continent. Yet, again, against all natural expectations from within the pain, loss, and uncertainty, a song of hope rang forth and carried people forward and outward in compassionate advocacy and works of justice. Of this one, we know the author. The words of Methodist Bishop Federico Pagura were arranged to a tango by the Uruguayan Pereira. Entitled, We Have Hope, the song celebrates Emmanuel, God with us, incarnate in our land and among our people. It's written in Spanish, the language of heaven, but I've tried to translate here for you. 
we have hope. Because God entered the world in history, because God broke silence and agony because God filled the earth with God's glory because God was light in our cold night because God was born in a lowly manger because God sowed love and life because God broke the hardened hearts and raised up the humble hearted por eso es que hoy tenemos esperanza por eso es... could you get the next screen please Por eso es que luchamos con porfía, por eso es que hoy miramos con confianza el porvenir. That's why we now have hope. That's why we do not give up the fight. That is why we look to the future with confidence in this, my land. Jesus attacked the ambitious business people and denounced the cruel and hypocritical. Jesus exalted the children and the women and resisted those who burned with pride. Jesus carried the cross of our sorrows and tasted the gall of all our evils. Jesus suffered our condition and so died for all mortals. I'm sorry we don't have the music here. Because a dawn witnessed God's victory over death and fear and all untruth. No one can now stop God's story or of God's eternal kingdom, the arrival. That is why we now have hope. That is why we do not give up the fight. That is why we look to the future with confidence in this, my land. Emboldened by that hope, some followers of Jesus dared to confront the military regime, advocated for the rights of people, and welcomed refugees displaced by neighboring dictatorships. Sadly, many others remained silent, ascribing more authority to the military regime and their fake peace than to the Lord Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Yes, Darkness is real today, across the world, as it was in the days of the first followers of Jesus and in Argentina during the dirty war. Wars rage, economies flounder, people are pried from land and home, basic human rights are violated here and around the world, millions wander deserts and drown in oceans. More and more people, Join the ranks of the unemployed, the homeless, and the landless. In spite of high-flung claims of trickle-down theories and peace accords, darkness is real and must be reckoned with. Even so, songs of hope can burst forth and are being sung in local languages with the rhythms of multiple hearts and the richly diverse music of different people. Because the good news for the world today is the same as it was for those first followers. There is no social, political, economic, or religious context in which God's gracious presence in word and spirit is not able to take on flesh and walk among God's people for the sake of God's good peacemaking purposes. God yearns to see the whole world whole, good, beautiful, fruitful, again, as it was in the beginning. God's unrelenting love will not give up on God's world. Christian mission belongs to no one nation or culture, church denomination or agency. It is God who is on a mission. And God does not carry out that mission by remote control, but by entering the world broken and pained as it is through Jesus, through the Spirit, and through God's people. And that's where we enter the story. As long as there's darkness in the world, God's people are sent. Sent as Jesus was. In the power not of empire, money, or technology, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Sent not only to do and say, but also to be. Sent to be with and to be 
for others, sent as a reconciled and reconciling community willing to suffer and break humanly devised borders as expressions, flawed and limited, but expressions all the same of God's kingdom and God's justice. More than a sectarian institution or a denomination, in a world of fear and estrangement and lonely individualism, God's people are called to be the living, breathing, loving community of disciples of the servant king. In a world of fierce competition and abuse of power, God's people are empowered, built up, and gifted by the comforting Holy Spirit in order to serve. In a world of false truths and fake news, God's people are called to live the truth. In a world of nationalisms, ethnocentrisms, and exclusivisms of all sorts, God's people are called to constitute a new and highly unlikely community of equals with interdependent relationships of mutual respect regardless of gender, and thank you, Shireen, regardless of age, social condition, or ethnocultural background. In a culture of fear, God's people are sent as Jesus was, sent in peace and told to not be afraid. Sent as Jesus was, the price of this mission is often very high, as it was for Jesus, for those early disciples, for the prophets of old and of today. To a culture set on guaranteeing personal security and alleviating pain, the message of the cross appears like anything but good news. Yet, the outstretched hands of the Lord who announced peace to his disciples and called them out of hiding into his mission were marked with the deep wounds of the crucifixion nails. In keeping with their model, followers of the Lord identified as a peace church for three centuries. They were willing to die for their faith, but never to kill for it. Orlando Costas talks about the shocking implications of realizing that in Christ, God, quote, does not transcend the predicament of human history by avoiding its perils, but rather by taking upon himself the infirmities and corruption of deformed humanity. And because of this, Christians discover Christ's real identity not by avoiding suffering, but by engaging prophetically in all the pain and confusion of our historical situations and particularly in the experience of the oppressed. Like when a young Honduran lawyer was murdered in broad daylight for defending the rights of workers, or when denouncing corruption in the university cost a Venezuelan study student her degree, or when offering safe haven to refugees branded a local church as lawbreakers or when advocating for people of color in the face of police brutality gar garnered another church expulsion from its denomination, or when preaching about God's heart for justice gained a leader expulsion from her seminary, or when fill in the space with your situation. The price is high, but we actually have nothing to lose because our lives don't belong to us to begin with. Even the wealthiest and most powerful of the world cannot add a day to their calendar. Our lives are fully in the hands of our creator and the life-sustaining spirit who grants us every single breath. That very same spirit can also grant us trusting confidence so that along with Paul, we can boldly affirm, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain, Philippians 1.21. And that same spirit can open the eyes of our fear-filled souls to recognize 
that no matter how immovable the troubles of this world might appear to be, how many blows we might sustain and how entrenched evil might feel, Jesus still is Lord. That, I believe, is good news. Sent as Jesus was. In a world in which a few people have the upper hand and others are expected to receive the hand they're given, God's people are called to counterculturally open up space for all people to give and receive, breaking bread at the table of life. Under Jesus' rule, there are no first and second class citizens. It's high time more recognition were given in the global Christian community, and especially in its powerful places, to the theological insights birthed in contexts of pain and deprivation. Rather than privileging concepts, categories, polarizations, and ideologies generated in places of power, and expecting the rest of the world to fit into them, the lived experience of people in places of pain must be given fair credit. I suspect the agenda of the church in the North is likely to be further stretched to include not only cultural wars and individual morality, but also global socioeconomic justice and ecological responsibility as it partners with fellow followers less insulated from these realities. Understandably, for a church that for over a century has conceived itself as the sender, the source of teaching and giving, recognizing a need to change and learn and receive does not come easily. But God's is the spirit of truth who reveals truth to those who have ears to hear. Sent as Jesus was. What is needed today is essentially the renewal of the church itself so that we may truly embody God's reconciling mission in all it does, says, and is rather than denominational, national, ethnic, or ideological agendas. This renewal involves a humble admission and joyful celebration that reconciled relationships are possible, not thanks to human ingenuity, political strategy, technical savvy, but thanks to the power of God manifested in Jesus' resurrection. Our societies need to know that life and joy are possible on this side of the grave. Death in its many crippling, dehumanizing expression does not have the last word. God's loving victory over death flings wide open the gates of communal creativity and imagination that had been trapped by fear and squelched by violence. The Apostle John's reminder to the persecuted believers scattered across the Roman Empire is still true today. Perfect love drives out fear. We need not fear as long as we're held in the embrace of God, the community of love. We too, as those first followers, can step out in humble boldness, recognizing that it's God's spirit of love and no other power which reveals truth, evicts fear, sows trust, and engages men and women in the active and just practice of God's reconciling mission from everywhere to everywhere. Another way of living is possible because of God's outrageously unmerited love, which no one deserves and from which no one is excluded. Jesus' parting words to his disciples were, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. 
Therefore, as you go along the way of life, the way of Jesus, mark them as belonging to the community of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to live everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you till the very end of the age. Freed from fear, may we open our doors wide to love, to give, to forgive, to seek justice and reconciliation in the power of the Holy Spirit until God's kingdom comes in full. May we pledge, may we pledge allegiance. May we pledge allegiance to none, none of the Caesars of the day, but to the only Lord, the servant king, and may we daily follow him into God's world. Amen.